welcome to Samba Scientific's Science Spotlight. Today, we are joined by Dr. Dave O'Connor, professor at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. Today, we'll be discussing how he and a coalition of scientists are working together to study the SARS CoV 2 virus. But before we get into the great work that you're doing, Dave, um, uh, with the COVID project, I'd like to begin with a question on social distancing. We're seeing an increase, an increasingly restless American public and companies looking for ways to get back to work. I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind commenting on why it is so important to maintain social distancing and adhere to other CDC guidelines. Sure, thanks Alex and, and thanks for having me here today. Um, the answer is that when viruses are spreading, there is um, a hope that in the long term we'll be able to have good drugs and good vaccines. But in the short term, the only thing we can control is our behavior. And we know from other viruses going back hundreds of years how we can stop the spread. And we stop the spread by not giving the virus new targets to infect. And the way that you do that for a respiratory virus like this one is to stop having people in close contact with one another. If you minimize the number of interactions people have, you minimize the number of chances the virus has to spread between people. And conversely, if you relax those too soon, um, you, you open yourself up to the possibility that the virus is going to come roaring back. So for example, if you start opening movie theaters, as has been discussed, uh, well, it might be really uh, uh, feel good and empowering to get back out and see a movie again, um, you're potentially going to be doing so at risk to yourself and others. Because one of the things that we're learning about this virus in particular is that really soon after you're infected, in the first day or two, is when your body is producing the most virus. What that means is that while you're still feeling fine, you're potentially going to be posing the greatest risk of transmission to others. So when you're the one out at that movie theater, that might be when you're at your most contagious. And it also means that when other people are at that movie theater, they're at their most contagious. And so the best thing you can do to try to keep the number of people low to avoid overwhelming hospitals is to keep yourself out of situations where um, you have lots of people coming into contact with one another and potentially spreading the virus. So, um, Dr. O'Connor, you've been researching infectious disease for over 20 years, uh, primarily in HIV and more recently in the Zika virus. What is it uh, about the SARS-CoV-2 that allows it to be more pathogenic to humans and uh, unlike similar viruses? Well, I'm glad you mentioned that, Alex, because as you said, I've been working in HIV for more than 20 years. And when I started working on HIV, we were more than 20 years into uh, the HIV epidemic. And HIV is itself an emerging virus. It was something that when it first uh, arrived, it was unlike anything any of us had seen before. It had not been studied intensively. There was not a whole lot of work on that type of virus, which was known as a retrovirus. Um, and so we had to learn everything uh, from scratch. And as we learned more about the virus, we learned that there was a lot about how the virus behaved that surprised us as scientists. And it made us uh, take some of the things that we first thought, like that it would be easy to make a vaccine and it proved us wrong over and over and over again. And there are some viruses that emerge suddenly that do seem to play by the rules. Zika virus is a good example. It definitely seems like for Zika virus, if your body mounts uh, what we call an antibody response against the virus, that protects from subsequent reinfection with the virus. It also means that making a vaccine for Zika virus um, would likely be straightforward. And the biggest reason we don't have one right now is because by the time the vaccine manufacturing and uh, got caught up, um, the number of cases in, in, in Latin and South America had really declined. So we didn't have enough people to test the vaccine in. 
Here we are confronted with a new virus. And then again, you see the same sort of initial confidence that we'll be able to make a vaccine in 12 to 18 months, that we'll be able to develop drugs that will help. And it's everyone's sincere hope that that is the case, that we'll be able to do this. Uh, but HIV and other viruses have taught us that it's not always going to be that simple. And until we know more about how the virus behaves, until we know what sort of tricks it has up its sleeve, it's gonna be really hard to be confident that any of those um, initial predictions that we're making are going to pan out. And so we need to be prepared just like uh, those of us who have been in the trenches in HIV have been working in it now for 40 years, not 40 days, not 40 weeks, but you know, 40 years, that this SARS-CoV-2 virus is potentially going to be part of our common heritage for the next several decades. And we're in the very, very, very first minutes of that right now. So um, that's a hard and bitter pill to swallow. And one thing I've been thinking of a lot recently is that you know when HIV came onto the scene, you know, I was a, a, a kid in the 1980s when uh, it really started spreading and, and, and received a lot of uh, attention in the US you know, there was a major shift in sexual health. There was a major shift towards wearing condoms, wearing barrier protection uh, for sex, because that was one thing that we could do to protect ourselves from getting the virus. Similarly now, a different sort of barrier protection with face masks um, can protect us from um, transmitting this virus to other people and, and getting the virus. And I think that just like we had to get, uh, get over ourselves and um, change our sexual habits and change the sort of cultural acceptance of condoms, we're gonna have to do the exact same thing now with face masks. And they're gonna have to become ubiquitous parts of daily life. Um, and it would have been unimaginable six months ago, um, but guess what? Six months from now, I think it's gonna be something that it's gonna seem strange, um, you know, like no shirt, no shoes, no service, no shirt, no shoes, no mask, no service. Um, fascinating uh, outlook. So I'm curious though, how do we learn more about the COV-2 uh, virus? What, what efforts are we putting in to establish uh, potentially a, a vaccine or work towards that effort? Well, the good news is um, that the SARS outbreak in 2003 gave us an, a, a shot across the bow and um, it made uh, the scientific community aware of the potential for dangerous coronaviruses causing human outbreaks. And then more recently, the MERS coronavirus, which affects um, people predominantly in the Middle East, um, acted as a more recent reminder that coronaviruses um, could be potential major human uh, pathogens. And so while, uh, you know, it was competing with for oxygen with other types of pathogens that also could cause major human outbreaks. So viruses that we've never seen before or highly pathogenic influenza or uh, mosquito-borne viruses that are getting uh, transmitted in new places because of uh, a climate change. Uh, there has been a fair amount of research on coronaviruses, including the development of some of the reagents necessary to study them, as well as some of the tools that one would need to develop a vaccine. So um, things like uh, figuring out how to stabilize the, the proteins that you would want to use in your vaccines. A lot of that work was done with SARS and with MERS. A lot of the animal models that are now being used to study SARS-CoV-2 were pioneered to study SARS and MERS. And so in that sense, uh, we were in um, uh, a reasonably good place. Um, but in another sense, uh, we're really starting from zero because every virus is different. And the, uh, the, there, there, there was an old uh, line in uh, the TV show, The Simpsons, where uh, Homer says, well, why should we vaccinate Bart for diseases he doesn't even have? And the same is true for a lot of infectious disease research. Why should we fund research into viruses that don't infect humans? Why, do, why should we fund pandemic preparedness if there's no pandemic? Well, the an this provides the answer to that. You do it because it, the, the cost of not doing it can be enormous when one of these 
uh, arrives on the scene. And so there hasn't been the sort of full-throated uh, research and public health investment necessary uh, to optimally prepare us uh, to fight off uh, a virus like this. And you really see evidence for that in the way that we handled the early response in the US. It's easy to say with hindsight, um, but we made a critical strategic error in not um, having dramatically expanded access to testing in the big cities where there were early travel associated cases. Um, and that's it, that, that mistake probably cost us not only uh, lives and a lot of suffering, uh, but also a significant amount of economic damage that could have been mitigated if we were able to uh, do a better job of containing some of those early infections before they became uh, explosive uh, epidemics. So I wanna follow up on that point about testing. Um, there's been you know, more and more reports about the limited access to testing. Is there any way that in, in your mind that we can address that issue? Is there, uh, is it a, more of an operations issue or is it just uh, the ability from a scientific standpoint to accurately detect the virus? Is that the challenge? Well, I, I'll be honest. I actually think um, now that we know that so much uh, of the viral shedding happens when people are still feeling healthy, that the emphasis on testing is a little bit misguided. I think it's essential that we have testing uh, both for the virus as well as for antibodies to the virus. Um, but I'm not entirely sure how that information is going to allow you to protect from transmission. Again, when most people will be transmitting the virus when they feel fine, because you're not gonna go in and get tested when you're feeling fine. You're not gonna get tested every day uh, you're not going to be able to get tested every week. You know, there's 300 million people in the United States. Even if people were tested 10 times a year, that's 3 billion tests a year. Um, you know, the tests aren't going to be free, no matter how you uh, pay for them. They're not going to be uh, universally available to everyone, no matter how you distribute them. Um, and if they require equipment or, or, or lab infrastructure, I don't see that as uh, a, 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 a practical way forward. Uh, what's nice about tests is that they're easily measurable. It's the sort of thing where a government or a state or a public health department can say that we performed X number of tests today. Um, and you can use that number of tests as a measure of um, your seriousness or your commitment to a response. And in a scenario where most of the transmission occurs after testing, knowing those test results would be absolutely crucial in trying to protect from onward transmission of the virus. Um, it's harder to imagine how those testing results are gonna be as useful when most people are gonna be highly contagious before they show any symptoms. And so in a sense, I think it's a little bit misguided, but I do think that the answer to your question about why is testing so limited, um, it falls uh, at the, the, the feet of uh, um, uh, a response that, again, has missed, has missed some opportunities uh, and also has um, suffered from a failure of coordination. Uh, you know, we have um, private sector companies, we have the power of the federal government, we have uh, clever and inventive academic scientists, um, and they're working together. Um, that's always a good thing to see is that people are working together. Um, but there isn't a sense of uh, organization. There is no one national resource that is basically saying, okay, we have a budget of $10 billion and we're gonna disperse this budget to uh, these groups to do these specific tasks and we're gonna fund them well to do, um, you know, test different types of uh, approaches. Instead, what, what, what's happened is you have small groups, um, and in some cases, companies, all sort of being frenemies and competing and cooperating at the same time, uh, where they're competing for market share, but they're cooperating because they all have the same general goal. Um, but that is disjointed, and it's not an efficient way of moving all of us in the same direction as quickly as possible. And so 
Um, the government is the one organization, the federal government is the one organization that has um, the purchasing power and the heft to make that happen. And to date, it simply hasn't. Okay, so maybe changing gears here slightly, I wanna address more specifically how you and your lab and the COVID project are addressing the SARS COVID-2. Would you mind telling us a little bit about that? Yeah, so in the middle of January, I was uh, visiting Cape Town, South Africa uh, as part of an HIV uh, uh, planning meeting uh, for a, a conference that I'm helping to organize. And while the US was focused on impeachment uh, in South Africa, the uh, coronavirus affecting Wuhan, China uh, was the front page news. And that was on uh, basically nonstop uh, 24 hour news channels it was probably taking up about half of the news coverage. And I simply had heard about it when I was in the US, but it wasn't, it didn't register as such a crisis until uh, I was there. And so I started talking to some of my colleagues, both who were at this HIV meeting, uh, as well as some of my colleagues back in Wisconsin and said, you know, is there any role that we might have in uh, helping to study this virus? And one of the things that my lab has done in the past is worked on animal models where we can infect animals, especially non-human primates, with a virus and know exactly when we've infected them, with what dose, with what strain, and can follow the animals to understand how they develop disease, understand how their immune responses work, and eventually use those systems to test vaccines and drugs. Uh, and so I asked around, and no one uh, in my close network of colleagues had really started any work on this virus uh, in the US. Uh, and so I basically said, well, why don't we? And so we started putting together a Slack channel um, and uh, we were originally uh, the Wuhan clan, but then we changed that once the virus moved outside of Wuhan uh, to the COVID. Um, and that is basically a loose network of people who um, are working on different aspects of uh, understanding how the virus behaves, especially in non-human primates, though we have some offshoots into things like testing and viral sequencing. Um, and one of the things that we're um, really passionate about is the idea that with the internet, uh, information sharing is a lot easier than it used to be. Uh, during the Zika outbreak, we made a lot of data available in real time uh, to the scientific community so that other scientists could learn from what we were doing well, as well as some of the mistakes that we were making. What are the things that we were doing poorly? Or if something doesn't work, there's no need for another scientist to redo the same experiment and get the same result. Um, and so that's a little bit heretical because typically science gets communicated through uh, peer reviewed publications and presentations at scientific conferences. So the idea of generating data on a Monday and putting it out uh, on the web on a Tuesday um, seemed uh, really unorthodox. And uh, it worked really well during Zika. So we tried to bring the same uh, mentality to, uh, to, to studying this virus. So is your data then accessible to um, scientists around the globe through Slack or through uh, another platform? It's, it's, it's uh, on a website, it's openresearch.labkey.com. Um, and one of the things that's been really great is that during Zika, we were the ones who were collecting all of the data ourselves. And so it was easier for us to put the data online. So uh, we were able to do it. Uh, for our early studies, um, we're actually doing it in collaboration with a facility at the NIH that doesn't have as much familiarity with it. So we can basically take uh, their Excel files or PowerPoints and, and share them. I mean, sharing information online in real time is something that we all do. Um, we do it when we send emails. We do it if we share pictures on Facebook. Uh, we do it if we download The Wire from HBO um, back in like the day when, when piracy was rampant. I mean, we're good at information sharing. This is something that we do a lot. Um, and the sort of scientific data sharing is um, just another facet of the same thing. Uh, I believe uh, HBO's The Wire is available streaming for free to everyone who's under stay at home. So hopefully y'all can check that out. It's a wonderful show. 
Um, so Dave, I want to follow up just on uh, another thing that you had said about this. What type of information are you sharing? You said PowerPoints, images, is this more virus sequence related or is this in general research, um, maybe publications, pre-publications, things like that? Yeah, so, so it, it's actually real-time data from our animal studies uh, is on there. So imaging uh, results from CT scans, PET scans, uh, quantitative imaging readouts, um, information on how uh, the animal's blood chemistries are changing over time, how uh, their immune cell subsets change over time, uh, as well as testing. So we are doing some um, you know, alternatives to the conventional ways of testing for the virus is um, methods. We've been sequencing a lot of the cases uh, coming into our region of Wisconsin. And so putting out the methods for how to do that, as well as the results and what we're learning from that, um, we basically try to open the spigot and, and, and make the stuff that we're doing available to other people. Because like in Zika, um, you know, we are uh, lucky that we're able to do these things and have been working on them uh, since January. And so um, by sharing with other people, not only can we share what we've learned with other people, but we can get valuable feedback from others that we can use to improve our, our, our studies. So it really works in both directions. So going forward, what resources do you think that, that you would need to, to build out this project or get further collaboration from you know, partners around the globe? Well, again, as I said earlier, with respect to funding from the federal government, I think a lot of it is gonna come from uh, the, the, the scientific stakeholders, the people who are funding research, really um, um, acting as a moral authority here in making people share their information if that's something that they, uh, that they value. So uh, agencies like the NIH have data sharing policies um, and uh, people have to include these when they write their grants, but there usually isn't an enforcement arm associated with them. So, you know, there's no one's gonna come from the NIH uh, data sharing enforcement police and make you put your data up online at any point. Um, but if they were more, uh, if there was more uh, of a reach, then I think you would see more of this. And I, I you know, I, I think uh, it was really heartening in an NIH video cast this week, um, the open real-time data sharing was highlighted um, as a, a, a great partnership between us and the group that was doing the work at NIH. Uh, and, you know, part of it hopefully will also come from word of mouth and then doing you know, the, the, the satisfaction of doing the right thing, um, you know, it, uh, without being too preachy about it, we're in an epidemic. I think sharing data is important. Um, as my friend Esper Callas once told me uh, during the Zika outbreak, he's a Brazilian and Zika, as you re might remember, uh, really impacted Brazil hard. You know, he said, when, when the, the house is burning down, you don't ask who owns the fire hose. You just start using it, and I, 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 that story sticks with me because I think that um, you know if we're in a privilege, if we're in a privileged position as scientists, and we're able to be collecting data, it's not for me to own the data. It's not for people in my lab. It's uh, for the greater good. You know, we're working with taxpayer money um, when we're doing, especially NIH-funded science. Um, it's not mine to keep. So um, fortunately, putting data online in real time hasn't compromised the ability of my students or staff um, to develop uh, productive careers of their own, to publish their work eventually in more conventional uh, places to, to present. And you know, frankly, I think that most people's work, they, they, you know, you, it's something that's near and dear to you, but it's more important to you than it is to anyone else. And, um, there isn't like a marauding group of scientists who are just waiting to, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, spy in on your data and then use it for their own nefarious purposes. That that just doesn't happen. Uh, so when we put data online, if someone wants to use it, they almost always are going to contact us and say, "Hey, it's great that you're putting this out there. I have a couple other questions that you don't really talk about on the site. Can we talk about this, or can we collaborate on this?" And so this idea that like there is like 
you know, there, there's like data thieves in the night just doesn't really jive with what my reality has been. So I want to close out on, on just one final question here. And how, that is, how do you expect this pandemic will change maybe your research or uh, scientific research overall uh, going forward? Right. So there's, um, I, I do think that the silver lining is that um, you really are seeing a level of global cooperation that we haven't seen before. Um, there's been especially great contributions made from Chinese researchers uh, who were among the first to have access to uh, samples who were working around the clock on this virus, um, they're just doing great, great science. Um, and, and that's often not as widely recognized um, in, in, in the Western uh, scientific canon. Um, I think you're seeing a more a, a really prominent role for preprint servers, which sort of occupy a middle space between real-time data sharing and conventional peer-reviewed science. Um, that is clearly, you know, it, there there really is no argument if if it's essential for a crisis like uh, this virus. Why isn't it also essential for heart disease, for cancer, for other types of research that are every bit as important to people who are. Uh, who are affected by, by, by those sorts of conditions and would benefit from that sort of research. I think that's gonna be a long-term uh, win. Uh, the downside though is that, you know, we're dealing with a virus now that is casting a gray cloud over the entire world. And um, the, the, the magnitude of the calamity um, has not yet sunk in and it might frankly take years uh, to come into focus. And we could be looking at um, a, a crisis whose costs are measured in uh, tens to hundreds of millions, trillions of dollars when all is said and done. And uh, scientific research has always been considered uh, an element of discretionary spending um, that is less uh, 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 mandatory at, than um, social spending for programs like Medicaid and Social Security and, and, and other forms of uh, social support programs. And so after the last recession in 2008, um, when the austerity practices came into place, um, it had a really devastating effect on the scientific enterprise and funding available for science uh, really, uh, really was, was very tight for a number of years. And um, I worry that if we have a much larger magnitude event, um, it could have the same sort of impact where uh, science uh, has to slow dramatically because there simply isn't going to be enough resourcing to fund a robust scientific enterprise at the same time as you're funding all of these other competing priorities that are also uh, essential and are fighting for the same, uh, the same pot of money. Dr. O'Connor, thank you so much for your time today. Um, we really appreciate your insights and we look forward to uh, further updates on the COVID project. I believe that was openresearch.labkey.com to check that out. Um, and to everyone out there watching, thank you for joining us. Subscribe to this channel and hear more about ongoing COVID-19 research. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Dr. Blasky.